Industrial Revolution, our greatest opus. An age of limitless progress. Sentinel-5, requesting an immediate sonar payload drop. Golden deployment in three, two... Hey guys, today we're going to be looking at everything that we know about The Order 1886 so far, from the story and the characters to all the possible locations, the weapons, and the gameplay. Since this is going to be quite a long video, I've put timestamps in the description for each different section that I cover, but I highly recommend that you watch the whole thing since Sony and Ready at Dawn have been a bit secretive about the project, and we'll go into quite a bit of detail about what they have shown us so far, and the important things that you might have missed, so hopefully you learn something new. So whether you've been following this game closely since it was announced, or know almost nothing about it, this video is for you, and if you are like myself and cannot wait for this game, it will hopefully make the month long wait that much easier. The Order 1886 is a character-driven third-person shooter set in alternate history London during the Victorian times. It was first announced at Sony's E3 press conference back in 2013 and development started in 2010 based on ideas and concepts that had been running since 2005. For Ready at Dawn, this project represents almost 5 years of hard work and I'd like to congratulate the team on going gold. So let's talk a little bit about the studio itself. Before development started in 2010, they worked primarily on PSP games, namely Daxter, God of War Chains of Olympus, and God of War Ghost of Sparta, which are among the highest rated PSP games of all time. As you can see, Ready at Dawn are a very capable studio with a strong pedigree, so the game is in good hands. You might have also noticed that Sony Santa Monica's name crops up in the trailers too, and this is because they have an external development team that helps other studios with their games, and Ready at Dawn is one of them. The game was developed completely using the studio's in-house engine. Everything, yes everything, that they have shown us of the game is running in real time, and it looks absolutely amazing. According to their panel at the Games Developers Conference last year, they started with just two graphics programmers, but I think now they have about five. It marks the first time that we have seamless transitions between CGI level cutscenes in gameplay. As stated by the team, they are going for a very filmic presentation to deliver a true cinematic experience from replicating the nuances of cameras and lenses used for films, to the way the camera lags behind the player when they move fast, as if a person is following him with a camera, filming the action. There is a core emphasis on story in the game, and the Order has a very rich mythology to serve as the backdrop already. We can expect the Order to have a strong narrative and some great writing, since the script for the game is written by creative director Rui Virasuria and Emmy Award winning scriptwriter Kirk Ellis, who is known for working on the HBO miniseries, John Adams. So let's talk about the soundtrack. The soundtrack is composed by British Academy Award winner, Jason Graves, who is known for his work on Tomb Raider and Dead Space. So far from what we've heard during the gameplay, the cutscenes and the trailers, the game is shaping up to have a rather epic soundtrack. During the PlayStation experience, Ready at Dawn showed a full track from the game called The Night's Theme, and this is linked in the description below if you haven't heard it before. So the story begins thousands of years ago, when humanity splits as a result of a genetically distinct group of people evolving and taking on bestial traits to become half-breeds. This led to an interspecies conflict, which has been waged for centuries with the half-breed seeking humanity's extinction. Years later in the 6th century, King Arthur brings together a group of individuals to form the Knights of the Round Table, which had the world's best warriors, tacticians and scientists, who swore to protect and preserve humanity from the half-breed threat. Despite the Order's best efforts back then, King Arthur realised that the fight against the Half-Breeds was a losing battle, as their ranks began growing smaller and the Half-Breeds were simply too strong. The members of the Order then stumbled upon a substance known as Black Water, which looks somewhat like Black Ink. It gives the drinker the ability to heal much quicker than the average human, live a much longer life, and have increased strength, but this comes at a cost, 
since it also chips away at their humanity and they have to live a long cycle of life and see loved ones die. It's helped the Order a lot in their fights with the half-breeds, and I'm very eager to hear more about its origin and where it comes from. Exactly what is it? Even with Blackwater, however, and being able to live for hundreds of years, the knights are not immortal, and they established a system of succession where if a knight is killed in battle or passes of time, they would pass on their name to a successor to carry on the sworn duty into a new generation. Fast forward to the year 1886, at the height of the Industrial Revolution when the game is set, and mankind has finally started to gain the upper hand in the war against the half-breeds, with the development of new technologies and weapons. Technology had to leap forward much quicker to counter the half-breed threat than it otherwise would have, and this explains why you have things in this alternate timeline, like airships, that didn't even exist in our time period back then. However, the Order just can't seem to catch a break, and it's just when they are able to fight back the half-breed threat properly, a new threat emerges in the form of a working-class uprising against the wealthy and powerful who have strong ties with the Order. Despite the rebels knowing about the war with the half-breeds, they don't let it stop them from taking action against their government. It has been stated that the Order has over 30 knights. Its headquarters are at the centre of the House of Lords, and they protect the realm under the orders of the Lord Chancellor. The Ouroboros is the symbol of the Order, which is why we've seen it around so much. It represents the eternal cycle of life of the members, and the everlasting struggle to maintain a delicate balance in a centuries-old war fought in the shadows of humanity. It is also a reminder to the knights of the cursed and selfless life that they have chosen to live. The story focuses on a squad of four knights, a new player's Grayson, the third to bear the title of Sir Galahad. He has defended mankind from the half-breeds for centuries, and you experience the entire game through his eyes. He is one of the elder knights of the Order, and is close friends with mentor figure Sebastian Mallory, who have known each other for a very long time, and who is like an older brother to him. He also mentored Lady Egraine back when she was a knight in training. He starts out the game as a steadfast and mostly unquestioning soldier in the ranks of the Order, even if he does sometimes have doubts about its rules. Having lived for hundreds of years, he has become rather detached from humanity, and you can see this at the end of the E3 trailer, where he gives a cold response about the policeman dying. For him, the ends justify the means, and that he'll do whatever it takes to get the job done. Nevertheless, he starts to realise that things around him aren't exactly what they seem. He also has difficulty wrapping his mind around the fact that he has begun fighting his own kind on the orders of the wealthy that the order serve, especially having spent his whole life protecting them from the half-breeds. And I personally cannot wait to see how his character develops over the course of the story based on the conflicts that he has to face. And as you can see in the video, he bears a scar on his left cheek, which probably comes from a half-breed. Sebastian Mallory is the second to bear the title of Sir Percival, and is the oldest and most experienced warrior in Galahad's squad. He is also Galahad's mentor and leader of the group. Sir Percival is a descendant of Sir Thomas Mallory, a real historic figure who wrote Les Morts d'Arthur. For those who don't know what the book is about, it's basically a culmination of stories about King Arthur, Guinevere, Lancelot and the Knights of the Round Table, and the Order 1886's lore is tied into these stories. He personifies the Order's noble agenda to protect the people of London, and he and Galahad share joint tempered loyalty to the Order and are close friends because of this. He is described as someone who commands everybody's respect around him, and who is ready to work outside the bounds of the law when the situation calls for it. He is as cold and ruthless on the battlefield as he has been a kindred mentor to both Galahad and Igraine. It will also be very interesting to finally hear his story about the mysterious figure that he was seen speaking to at Whitechapel, which Galahad questions him about in the airship demo from the PlayStation experience. Now we have Isabeau Dargel, otherwise known by her title Lady Igraine, who was the youngest person ever to join the Order. Her title comes from King Arthur's mother, who was also known as Lady Igraine. As mentioned before, she was Sir Galahad's apprentice before becoming a fully-fledged knight. Over the years, they developed a strong bond with each other, and there is a hint that were it not for their vows to the Order, they could have become something more. She is described as a strong-willed character who is not only skilled in combat, but fiercely loyal to the Order. According to Rue Verisuria, Isabeau is every bit the knight that Galahad is, and there is a friendly rivalry between the two. Also, if you look on the left side of her neck in the image, you can see that she bears three scars, which by the looks of it, comes from the scratch of a half-breed. Whether this happens before the game is set, or during it is a mystery though. Next up is Marquis de Lafayette. 
Now you may be wondering why he hasn't got a title yet of the name of a knight from Arthurian legend, and this is because he is still an apprentice. It is only after years of training and service to the order that an apprentice is finally given a title. He is an actual historic figure, famous for fighting in the American and French revolutions, and because of this, the order takes an interest in him. He is recruited into the ranks of the knights by Sir Percival, who opened his eyes to the deeper and more pressing conflicts faced by not just England, but humanity itself. He is the youngest member of the squad and adds some humour into the game, against the seriousness of the other members and to keep things light in the midst of dark events. According to Andrea Pacino, the chief technology officer of Ready at Dawn, there are times in the game where he's actually really funny, which sounds just like my kind of guy. So Nikola Tesla is the chief scientist of the Order, who provides the knights with weapons and devices based on real things that he did back then. So he's basically like what Leonardo da Vinci was to Ezio back in Assassin's Creed 2. He moves to the United States in 1884, where he worked in the company of some of the most influential people of the time there. However, when he caught the interest of the Order, he was convinced to return to Europe and join the group to be their chief scientist, where he proved to be an invaluable asset. The genius of his inventions are the foundation of the many weapons and devices that you get to use in the game, from the art gun to the communicator. In terms of the weapons, what Tesla did was retrofit the conventional weaponry of the time, which makes the weapons all the more believable, and explains why, for instance, that there's a combo gun without the ability to shoot a powerful blast of air, as it doesn't have his modification, and this is probably one of the weapons that the rebels use in the game. However, as we saw from an early build of the game, the rebels seem to have found a way to get their hands on these more advanced weapons, and Tesla himself worries that the weapons that he has created may help lead to the Order's downfall. So you might be wondering why the screen is dark for now with just a question mark, and this is because not all half-breeds are represented by the lichens, with the lichens just being a particular species of them. The other species are yet to be revealed, and probably won't be shown until you play the game, I am personally very excited about the idea of facing and learning about the other species, but time will tell whether they're actually in the game or not, although signs are pointing towards more being revealed. There are many of them, and they seem to thrive in different regions depending on their kind. The fact that there are different species could also open doors for potential sequels. So on to the lichens. The lichens are found in Northern Europe, and it can be assumed that they share territory with the other half-breeds. As you can see, they look very similar to werewolves and they are known to have some kind of a hierarchy like the one of a wolf pack. The one that Galahad fought in the E3 demo was an elder which are the veteran warriors in the species. They have shapeshifting abilities which makes them that much harder for the order to track since they can quickly morph into normal human beings. I also want to discuss a theory that because of their shapeshifting abilities there could potentially even be a double agent in the order itself since they can look just like normal human beings at will and serve undercover as a knight. Of course, this is just pure speculation on my part, but it would add an interesting twist, and we'll have to find out what happens when the game finally ships to see whether my imagination is going too far. Now what the lichens lack in numbers, they far make up for in their strength and agility. Not only do they have the physical edge over humans, but they are also smart, with the ability to speak in their true form making them all the more terrifying. They are extremely resilient to gunshots and have a very strong sense of smell, which they will not only use against their prey, but also against you. Something that was quite intriguing that cropped up in the Little Bobby Page trailer released recently was that getting bitten by a lichen can actually turn you into one of them, or at least something similar, since it looked like Bobby couldn't control his transformation, whereas they can. This would be very consistent with Werewolf Legends and has me that much more excited about what's in store for us next month. We also know that we'll be facing at least 10 in the game, since there is a trophy for killing 10 lichens. One more thing to add is that if we look back to the newspaper in the Pledge trailer, we get a hint that Jack the Ripper exists in this alternate timeline. There is a possibility that he is a half-breed himself, since lichens are known for killing and feasting on humans, and the fact that they can shapeshift would explain why he would have been hard to track. The rebels are those who believe that the Order are only there to protect the wealthy and powerful, while the poor struggle to survive and are easy prey for the half-breeds. They rose up in rebellion to address the inequalities present in the society and to look for justice. They far outnumber the rich, and a lot of them live in the slums and alleyways of Whitechapel. There are rumours that in their desperation for justice and from being outgunned, that they have turned to the half-breeds and formed an alliance with them. As a result, 
Concerns grow that this distraction from the half-breeds will grant the half-breeds the perfect opportunity to strike in a deeper, more vicious way than ever before, especially when the Order has finally been able to fight back effectively. It will be interesting to see how the threat of the rebellion is dealt with, especially considering who Galahad gets orders from, which he has to follow. And just to finish off, I want to discuss two more important characters. We were actually first shown these characters near the beginning of last year, but we didn't know who they were until recently. The first is a high level ranking officer of the Order, known by his title Sir Lucan and his real name Alistair. Is it just me, or does he look a lot like Michael Fassbender in the concept art? We were finally introduced to him in a segment from the PlayStation Experience demo. According to an earlier conversation between Galahad and Lady Igraine, he is her brother. He appears to be someone who is strongly driven by his allegiance to the Order and seems to be very intent on bringing the rebels down. So let's turn back to the original image and look at the character in the middle with the long beard. We find out from the recently released story trailer that he is the Lord Chancellor. He is the leader of the knights and it is his orders that the knights obey, although he doesn't seem like the kind of person that I would particularly trust. I am personally hoping for a story which doesn't represent the different factions in black and white, but one that deals in moral greys, and this seems to be exactly what we're going to get. As previously mentioned, a neo-Victorian style of 19th century London will serve as the backdrop to the story. According to the Order's Facebook page, some of the locations that Galahad's adventure will take us to are the streets of Whitechapel, the docks of Blackwall Yard, and the halls of the Palace of Westminster, where more mysteries are set to be revealed. So let's first talk about the locations that we have already seen. We've had a look at some of the Whitechapel district in the E3 playable demo with the Thermite Rifle, and also in the first build of the game that we saw early last year. Whitechapel is located in East London, and as you can see from the demos that we've been shown, it's this very gritty, violent place with narrow claustrophobic streets, which was exactly how it was back then, and Ready at Dawn have done a great job of recreating it. There are bound to be lots of rebels operating there, since it was a working class neighbourhood, and which would explain why most of the sections that we have seen in Whitechapel are focused on them. Since it was the area where Jack the Ripper was active, if there's a place we find him in the game, it will most likely be here. We've also seen a bit of the London Hospital which is located there, and is where Galahad is featured walking around the basement just before encountering a lichen. A showcase of just how atmospheric the game is, especially with the soundtrack playing in the background. We also know that one of the chapters is set in an airship known as the Agamemnon, which the rebels seem to have infiltrated, and where Galahad and his squad set out to foil a rebel plot. The airships are known as Sentinels, which is why when you hear Galahad communicating with them, he refers to them as such. The reason why they exist is to help the Order spot half-breed activity from miles away while patrolling the skies, making them an invaluable tool for the Order considering how hard the half-breeds are to track. People have also speculated that Sir Francis Galton might be in the game too, because when Galahad asks for a sonar payload drop in the Gamescom trailer, the airship talks about a Galton deployment. For those who don't know, Sir Francis Galton invented the dog whistle in 1876, so it would also make sense that he would invent a way to help find the half-breeds if he existed in the alternate timeline. So let's move on to talk about a number of locations that we haven't seen properly, but signs point towards being in the game, with the first being the Royal Exchange. According to the notes on the concept art, it is home for some of the most famous merchants across London, and that even though the sales floor is the main attraction, there is a potential secret hidden underneath. We can see it in this freeze frame from the player's reactions trailer in front of Galahad right there, with the same garden in front of it. Also, if we look to the right of where Galahad is shimmying on the ledge, we can clearly see some sort of building that he plans to infiltrate. At first, I thought the building was the Royal Exchange, but the architecture looks different on a close analysis. I'm sure that we've seen this location in the game even before this, in the Gamescom trailer, where we see Galahad take someone out stealthily with a crossbow, and another with a knife, as the gardens you see in them look almost exactly the same. According to the Order's Facebook page, we know the London Underground is definitely one of the many places that we'll get to explore. It sounds like a good place for the half-breeds to go about their business, and would be a great location for bringing out the horror elements of the game. 
I think the places shown in the screenshots may be set there, where Igraine and Galahad investigate bodies that the half-breeds have been feeding on, because they just look reminiscent of an underground station to me, especially with how dark the environment is, although I could be wrong. Next up are the docks of Blackwall Yard. The notes on the concept art, which refer to it as Riverside, tell us it's used by merchants and businesses alike, and that some of the incoming shipments may contain new technology or unknown secrets, so it will be cool to find out what Galahad and co are doing there. The reason I think that this is Blackwall Yard is because we have confirmation from the Facebook page that it's in the game, and because it was by the River Thames, hence the term Riverside. Also, if we look at the footage, you can see the word United India Shipping on the warehouse to the right, and the East India Company used to use the yard for building and repairing ships during the 17th and 18th centuries, adding further proof that this location is what I think it is. Concept art also seems to indicate that one of the chapters will feature the Custom House of London in Mayfair, which is shown at the bottom of the image. In 1825, it partially collapsed due to mismanagement in the original construction, but Ready at Dawn will most likely put their own twist to it. There are hints that the foundation might have actually been sabotaged by the rebels, who currently threaten the citizens of London, since the sabotage of an important government structure is a common tactic of the rebellion. I also think that the snippet that we get here with the pool tables might be in this very location. If Industry Insider Shinobi602 is to be believed, there will be some area similar to the artwork that you see here with larger numbers of NPCs. This would just be incredible, even though we are told not to expect hundreds of NPCs on screen at once. However, despite the fact that he's been right about a lot of things in the past, I would still take this with a grain of salt. Regardless of what he said, Andrea Pacino has confirmed on Twitter that there will be plenty of open spaces anyway, so while there is no doubt that the game will stay linear, there should still be a lot of space to explore, at least in a similar vein to Uncharted, especially when there are plenty of collectibles in the game to find too. These include photographs, documents, newspapers, and phonograph cylinders. First up is the M2 Falkian Auto Rifle, otherwise known as the Combo Gun. It's the bread and butter of the Order's arsenal, and as you can see in the image, it has two triggers for each different barrel. The first is for shooting enemies, and the other barrel delivers a concussive blast that knocks foes back as if you just used force push on them. It's been described as kind of like the Victorian version of the AK-47, and it's been used a number of times in the demos that we've seen. The Thermite Rifle is a light machine gun, that fires highly flammable thermite pellets. After you fire them, you can shoot a high temperature flare out to where you fired the pellets, and it'll ignite everything that it's set upon in the environment. This makes it a great weapon for burning through the enemy's cover. Alternatively, you can shoot the flare out first and fire the thermite pellets afterwards to create a big explosion. The magazine can act as an explosive if placed and ignited, and it's rumored that some of the puzzles in the game based on welding and cutting objects involve doing this. The art gun features an experimental Tesla coil that lets out a focused stream of electricity after it charges up, and I love the way it just seems so unstable when you fire it. When it charges up with electricity, it becomes stored in the Jacob's ladder of the gun and can find its way to an enemy, which is why you don't really see the beam go into a straight line when Lady Igraine fires it here. And as you can see here when the player fires it at this guy, it finds its way to the rebel's head and blows it up leaving nothing but his bowler hat. Next up is the Three Crown Coach Gun, a triple barreled shotgun that can fire three slugs at the same time. Seeing this weapon in action showcases just how much you can feel its impact when you fire it, and also its brutality with the ability to dismember enemies. We see this happen here where it literally blows off this guy's legs. We also found out recently that there's another gun in the game called the RA5 Repeating Shotgun, and you can see it on Galahad's back in the image. Now we have the M85 Auto Mitish, which is a pretty standard gun in the game that we've seen used a number of times by both the Knights of the Order and the Rebels. And according to those who have played the game, this weapon seems to have quite a hefty bit of recoil to control too. We can see that it looks like it's based off the PPSH-41, which was a fully automatic submachine gun used during World War II, except with a different ammo drum. We have the M84 Marksman Carbine, a sniper rifle that can be used in medium to long ranges 
outfitted by Tesla with variable magnification telescopic sights. And there is also the M82 self-loader carbine, which looks to be a semi-automatic rifle and reminds me of the Lee Enfield rifles used by British infantrymen during World War I. The repeating arbalest crossbow is a weapon that I'm really excited about using, and it just fits the whole neo-Victorian gothic style that Ready at Dawn are going for so well. We're told that it'll have to be used in the game where something more subtle than a firearm is needed, so it's more of a stealthy weapon, and is perhaps a hint to there being open-ended stealth sections, hence why something like this would be needed. And we also know that it features a scope for making more accurate shots. The C81 machine and pistol is a fully automatic machine pistol used by the Knights of the Order. The word machine and pistol in German just stands for machine pistol, and it's loosely based off the Mauser C96, which was a semi automatic instead. And it's fitting that the weapon in the game has a German name, since the weapon it's based on in real life was produced by German arms manufacturer Mauser. So next up we have the C78 autoloading pistol. It's a standard pistol that is effective against humans but weaker against the half-breeds. You can also see that it's loosely based off the Luger used by the Germans during World War I and II. We got confirmation that you'll be able to wield a revolver in the game and it's known as the M4 Dragoon revolver which we see Galahad use here during Black Sight. For an idea of the way that it handles during normal gameplay we actually got a look at it quite a while ago here where you can see Sir Percival firing it, and it looks like a powerful sidearm too. So we know that there are both smoke and explosive grenades that we can use. The explosive grenades look kind of like the potato masher grenades that the Germans used during World War 1 and 2. They also feature a small spike that allows them to be stuck into walls or the floor to create a proximity mine. We can see Galahad using the explosive grenade shown in the previous image right here in the footage. We know you can use smoke grenades too, as the control scheme in the past has shown that you can select them with the top directional button. Galahad uses this on the airship in this scene here specifically, and you can see that they look quite different from the explosive grenades. In terms of the devices, we have the communicator and the TS-27 inverter rectifier, but we'll focus on the communicator for now. It's a wireless device allowing the knights to communicate with each other and the airships that patrol the skies. Tesla started out his career as a telephone engineer and worked a lot on wireless communication, so Tesla inventing something like the communicator would make a lot of sense. We also see an additional use for it here, or at least something similar, where it can be thrown to an area to bring something down on it from the sky. And finally, we have the TS-27 inverter rectifier. You can see it used here in the form of a minigame to blow out the power and cause a distraction. We don't really know what else it can be used for though for the time being. So let's talk about the aspects of gameplay that haven't already been discussed in the previous sections. Getting the obvious out of the way, we know the Order 1886 is a third person cover based shooter and a lot of those who have played it have compared it to Gears of War. On the surface, it may seem like it's not much different from what has come before it, but Ready at Dawn have actually added in a number of things to distinguish the Order from other games. For instance, the camera is a lot closer to the player. Because of this, when you're in cover, it actually looks and feels like you're in cover. Due to the lack of visibility, they added in a peak mechanic where you can look over or around you to get a better view of what's going on. They also put in a soft cover mechanic that kicks in after you're in cover, similar to what was in The Last of Us, where you can shift or change cover easily without having to press the cover button again, so they've effectively put in place a hybrid system. Everything in the game comes from motion capture too, including the cover system, so it feels more like a real person's movements when you control the character. Now there are some quick time events in the game, which has irked a few people, but I personally don't see any problem with using them, as long as they are used effectively and in moderation, like in their previous God of War titles. The reasoning behind using them during cutscenes is to stop the player from putting the controller down and to make them feel more involved and immersed in what's going on in the story, especially when Ready at Dawn have a chance to do this effectively, since cutscenes run in real time. They have also changed it up a bit too, as in some scenes, you are required to assess the situation first to find a way to getting through it, such as looking for something that can be used as a weapon, which you saw happen here when Galahad used the fire extinguisher to take out the rebel. 
There is also some form of branching in the way QTEs play out, which means that specific action scenes play out differently for each player depending on their choice, and it reminds me of games like Heavy Rain and Beyond Two Souls. However, this doesn't change the fact that the game will have a single ending. The melee system is dynamic, in that it's affected by the environment. What this means is that the animation that plays out when you press the melee button depends on what's going on around Galahad. So if an enemy is about to hit you and you press it in time, you will dodge them and take them out, or if they are near a wall, you will bash their head into it. You can also drag enemies over to you if they are on the opposite end of the same cover and take them out. This is not all there is to melee in the game though. There was also a different section teasing melee combat against the Lycan, and it will be very interesting to see how it plays out in the final game. When it comes to stealth, you'll also have to time the button right to execute the enemy correctly, otherwise the enemy will spot you, making stealth situations all the more tense. You can throw back grenades too, and there was a lockpicking section in the airship demo, bringing more variety in the gameplay. So in analysing the heads-up display, let's first look at the black sight meter, which you can see right at the bottom. Black sight is some sort of enhanced bullet time. The reason it exists is because it's a secondary effect of using black water for a long time, so the knights can act much faster than normal human beings, as the black water allows them to hone their skills better, so it makes a lot of sense within the narrative. You can also shoot grenades thrown by the enemy mid-flight and detonate them in slow motion, and there is a gold trophy for this. So if we turn back to looking at the heads up display, we'll see that there's a vial of black water depicted right above the black sight meter. At first, I thought it was just a way of showing what the black sight meter meant, but it's there for another purpose. If you are downed in the game, you do not die straight away. Instead, you have a chance to find cover, and if you do, you can drink a vial of black water for health regeneration, but only once, and then the next time you're downed, it can be assumed that it's game over, since the detail in the picture of the vial becomes empty afterwards to signify that you've used it up. There are two uses of the touchpad that we know about so far. The first is tapping out Morse code to send to the airships. Apologies for the poor quality of the photo, but this was the best one that I could find. The second use involves touching the pad during gameplay to adjust the camera bias, meaning that it swaps which of Galahad's shoulders that you'll be looking over. The Order 1886 comes out next month on Friday the 20th of February, which is just a few weeks away from now. If you're looking for a cinematic, story-driven game with a strong narrative, solid gameplay mechanics and fun weapons to use, I am pretty confident that The Order will deliver. I really think it's going to surprise some people and I can't wait to finally see what the visuals look like on my TV. It also seems like there will be some great horror elements thrown in to spice things up too, with the half-breeds and some of the dark environments showcased thus far. The Order 1886 will have no multiplayer in any shape or form as the team is focusing mainly on making the single player experience the best that it can possibly be. According to industry insider Shinobi, the campaign is about 10 to 12 hours long if you explore and take your time, but around 8 to 10 if you're going at a normal pace. There is still so much that we don't know and I can't wait to get my hands on it. If the folks at Ready at Dawn are watching this, I also hope you guys incorporate a photo mode in the game for us to play around with. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video and learnt something new. Thank you so much for watching, especially if you've been here right from the beginning of the video. Please hit that like button, share and subscribe for all things PlayStation related, as there are more videos to come in the next few weeks, including my final review of the game. And I'll see you guys next time.